Well, again, as always, thank you for having me. I enjoy um, talking with uh, you guys at Seven Signal, guys and gals, and uh, very nice to have the interaction at the end of these sessions and nice to hear what people are thinking and um, all of that. So, you know, for various reasons, thank you. Today's topic is how accurate does that site survey need to be? I will um, get it right out there. There's not an answer that's gonna come at the end of this. Um, not a clear answer. This is more uh, food for thought, stir up some discussion, challenge perhaps uh, conventional wisdom. And uh, hopefully, like I say, there's some good discussion at the end. That's really what it's about is sharing ideas and perspective and opinion. and. Uh, perhaps thinking critically about things that sometimes we just take for granted. At least that's my, my goal here. Um, I don't want to be arrogant and say most of you know me, but I've done a lot of these and I know that a lot of uh, the folks on the calls are repeat uh, customers, so I don't need to get into me. Let's get into the content. Again, um, you know, the, the framework that we're going to talk about, you know, accuracy and site surveys. And that image, for what it's worth, you're looking at a um, heat map represented out of the uh, MIST uh, dashboard, just for what it's worth. That's where that one comes from. Um, nothing to do with the topic per se, just nice picture that fits. So, you know, this is really going to be a short presentation. Um, it's a silly question. The survey needs to be hyper accurate. And we're done. So thank you for coming. We're done. Just yeah, kidding. It. Just <laughs> kidding. Um, again, um, you know, there's a lot more to talk about. Although, as silly as that last slide was, um, I do know people and that is the mindset. It needs to be hyper accurate. There needs to be this insane degree of uh, precision. And, and that's part of what I kind of want to maybe chip away at or challenge. Um, well, let's see what happens here. So to me, when I contemplate site surveys in general, you know, I, I find myself thinking, well, what is the purpose of the site survey? Um, they're not all the same. They're not all done for the same reasons. They're not all done under the same circumstances. At least in my world, they're not. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And that might even get us into semantics. What is a survey when it comes to Wi-Fi? And then the always uh, controversial, are you providing a service or are you consuming a service? I know some of us do surveys for ourselves Others do surveys for a living and others buy surveys from those who do them for a living. And I will um, stick my neck out and say whatever category you're in also influences probably how you uh, see surveys and the need to be uh, accurate. Little, little tease about some of what's coming. So what is a site survey? Well, break it down. We got two words, um, you know, site. It's either a, a room, space, building, a campus, but it, it's spatial. It's a place where client devices are gonna be. And then that can, you know, take on various forms, but it's a place where fine client devices wanna enjoy that sweet, sweet Wi-Fi. So that, that's the first half of our site Survey, what is the survey? You're gathering signals to tell you something about that wireless environment, about that wireless site. And it's going to represent a discrete time that each point that you walked around doing your survey, assuming you're walking around doing your survey, but at each measurement point, you know, that point in time, all of those uh, bits of information are gathered up about signals at the site and it's all presented in a way that uh, hopefully has some kind of purpose around it. Uh, that's kind of the sloppy uh, beginning definition of what a site survey actually is. And maybe that sounds uh, far messier and far dumber than some of you might think of when you contemplate what you do with your favorite survey tool and uh, 
certainly the process of doing a survey for many of us that are uh, many of you that are probably watching is a lot more elegant. It's uh, it's just not that messy as described. And I, I'm being purposeful in my uh, my choice of words here, and my choice of ideas. So I say there's lots of reasons to do a site survey. Um, hopefully I don't bore you verbatim word for word on the bullet points. But um, you know that, that notion of a general sense, all of these presented on this slide are things that I do fairly regularly. Um, Got to go to a site. It may not be one of my own sites. It might be a site I'm inheriting. It might be a site somebody just needs help on. I'm looking for a general sense, the operating phrase. What's going on here when it comes to Wi-Fi? Can you go do a survey? That can be a different kind of survey from a validation survey or a verification survey. What am I verifying? Design, new design, old design after some spaces or after some walls were moved around? Um, exactly what is it that we're doing? Are we troubleshooting? You know, you might in your mind think, well, troubleshooting isn't site survey. And I'm saying that frequently they, they're really one in the same. Uh, just all how you approach it. Or we might have different client devices that we're trying to figure out why some are working in one fashion and others are, uh, you know, acting differently within the same environment. So handful of reasons. These are just examples of why you might do a quote unquote site survey and then, you know, putting some differentiation on the, the different um, categories, if you will, or different shadings of that concept of site survey. So that being said, do different surveys warrant different levels of accuracy? Well, you can probably guess that my answer is, oh, heck yes. Let's talk about that a little bit. As a consumer of my own surveys, um, you know, I'm going to approach this differently, all of these, probably, um, than somebody who's actually, you know, doing the survey thing for a service, uh, as I mentioned before. So let's, let's look at some of this. It, when I'm generally characterizing a space, you know, these are the things I'm looking for. When I say that whole general characterization, get in, get out get as much information as you can. Um, none of these bullets here, and again, I don't want to bore you by, by reading them all um, you know, verbatim, but at the bottom there, the last summary, none of the steps that are required for general characterization require great precision. Furthermore, the person using the tool is probably more important than the tool itself when you're doing this general character characterization. I could take the most expensive survey tool in the world, put it in inexperienced and untrained hands, and they can go um, come back with all kinds of bad ideas, um, you know, inaccurate ideas. I can also take a free, you know, Android based free uh, wireless app on the cheapest dual band cell phone and do a better job than the guy with the very expensive tool who doesn't know what he's doing if I'm the guy with the Android phone in that app that knows exactly what I'm doing. So again, when you talk about the general characterization, just trying to get a sense of what's going on, you can come away with a lot of information in a short amount of time, being very imprecise. And guess what? I did a survey. What about targeted troubleshooting? To me, you know, when I'm troubleshooting, uh, actually dealing with one of these this morning, um, it really is kind of like a sub site survey or a mini site survey. You know, maybe I'm in just a room or maybe I'm comparing one room to another, but what am I looking for on this kind of survey? I'm looking for coverage gaps or maybe coverage overloading too many APs in one spot, power is uncoordinated, channels are uncoordinated, I'm just getting deluged with, um, you know, too much, too much Wi-Fi is not a good thing. Uh, maybe I'm looking for interference, right? 
a lot of times this may not bubble up into your mind as doing a survey per se, but it very much is. You're, you're gathering signal information. You're in a specific location. You're going to come away with something that you can report to people. May not be graphical, may not need to be precise, but you're surveying. You're, you're absolutely uh, surveying. And then there's the big one, design verification, design validation, pick your V word, they're kind of interchangeable um, for this topic. Um, again, it's what I'm calling the big one. And this is where the pricey tools, this is where people are making money doing uh, this sort of survey. In red there, uh, that phrase, I didn't realize that it was like a, a phrase that was out there um, beyond uh, you know, out there in the wild. I first heard about it when I became an adjunct instructor for the university where I work and a good friend and um, I guess you could call him a mentor. Uh, when he was presenting, uh, you know, wireless to his class, that phrase jumped right off of his syllabus that I was looking at and stuck with me. A fool with a tool is still a fool. You can put the, you know, like I said before, you can take that very expensive tool put it in the wrong hands and you can do more harm than good. You can come away with more bad information than good information. I, I just absolutely love that phrase. And then when I was trying to find it's um, where it came from, it turned out that it was something I happen to have never have heard, but it's out there in the bigger world. So maybe, you, maybe you've all heard that before, but I love it. I absolutely love it because it says so much in just a few words. <laughs> You know, the pricey survey tool doesn't guarantee survey success. You know, also with that tool, if I know what I'm doing, um, you know, if the goal of that survey is to hand somebody a report where everything is just perfectly green and they're not going to be happy until that report is perfectly green, there's all kinds of little things I can tweak, all kinds of offsets maybe play games with the scaling. I can do, uh, I can do a lot of stuff that might be uh, less than uh, above board if you know what you're doing. And I'm not saying that anybody does this, but it can be done. It's just one example of, I hand you a survey report. How accurate is it? Well, you're trusting me to put honesty into it and experience and knowledge and proper tweaking of the tools. Um, and to be, uh, you know, ethical. But none of this is answering the original question. How accurate does the survey need to be? I'm just going to keep answering my own question with questions, at least for a little bit. You know, how, can, how accurate can it be? Have you set up the floor plans right? If you have, you know, you've scaled them. And um, if your methodology requires the um, insertion of walls and uh, loss um, values for different sources of where you're going to have losses. If the way you're doing your survey and what you're doing your survey for requires all of that, all of that influences the accuracy, you know, kind of goes to the how accurate can it be. If you've gotten everything exactly perfect, is RRM in use? When you're surveying, you know, are the radios dynamically changing power? Are they dynamically changing channels? Or is everything set statically? That, that's going to make a difference for, um, you know, again, the accuracy of the survey and the, the shelf life of the survey. What is it that you're surveying for? I can survey for coverage and say, yep, the Wi-Fi here is great. It's fantastic. Might only support 10 users, but it's fan freaking fantastic. What is it that you're surveying for? Um, that really obviously makes a difference. One of my favorite, uh, the most confounding, um, you know, wireless tenants, whether it be for surveying or whether it be for supporting, administrating, administering wireless networks, whatever. Uh, do you really know what client devices and counts will be in play? you're usually putting out a wireless network that's going to be in place for X number of years. How many client refresh cycles are going to happen in those years? 
how close are you on the timeline of you know a brand new iPhone being introduced? You're doing your survey today. Two months from now, a new iPhone comes out. It's going to be a lot of iPhones in your environment. Is that survey any good? Probably, probably it's not worthless, but it's not the same as if you were surveying for those new iPhones. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and now let's get into what might really kind of spin some people. None of us are using calibrated lab equipment when we do these surveys, whether you're using IB Wave, whether you're using um, Ekahau, uh, Hamana, doesn't matter what you're surveying with, even the sidekick from um, Ekahau, regardless of what your equipment is, you're not sending that stuff in once a year to get calibrated. Uh, this is not lab grade equipment that we're using. So if we're not using calibrated test equipment, even if we got everything else right, how accurate are we gonna be? When we start handing out numerical values on the survey reports, how accurate are those really? Furthermore, individually, there's a human being behind each one of these tools. How well does that human being understand our, uh, like truly understand it? Um, you know, and as I've said before, why are you actually doing the survey? What is the technical point? Besides the pretty green floor plan, why are you there and what are you doing? And all of these bear on the, the overall notion of accuracy and the need for accuracy. Still doesn't answer the question, how, how accurate does it need to be? But I'm challenging that with how accurate can it be? I do want to take a little bit of a detour and talk about the human aspect, um, the, the notion of titles uh, when it comes to each one of us. In my own titles, um, those I have been given by my employer and those I have been given by uh, past employers and uh, certifications that I have. Uh, if you were to read my titles, I'm an architect, I'm an engineer, I'm an expert, I'm all of those. I freaking walk on water. I'm huge. Eh, I, I don't buy into it. I'm not using calibrated test tools. I'm not board certified beyond CWNP for my uh, CWNE certification. I'm just not these things. I'm not an architect. I'm not a certified engineer. Yeah, they're good working titles. They kind of summarize what I do. I do design networks. Um, from the engineering perspective, I put them together, I run them. Um, but when you think about what those titles typically mean in the professional world, I'm not, I'm not any of those. And even an expert, that fuzzy title, I know a lot, but I don't know it all. And that's a double-edged sword being labeled an expert. So all of that being said, you know, my own surveys, they're going to be good in their various forms but there's no way I'm handing somebody something and saying the numbers that are on this report, you can take to the bank. They're absolutely 100% accurate. <laughs> and uh, five minutes after I leave, they're not going to be invalidated when doors start opening and, uh, you know, fold out walls start getting folded out and, you know, metal racks start getting moving around and the environment changes and, uh, somebody pops up some interference source that wasn't there when I was there. It, you know, it's just, you have to be careful with how serious you take yourself and what you're doing. Still haven't answered the question. Yes, I know. So are you buying a survey? Are you charging for a survey? If you're charging, are you doing it by the hour? Are you doing it for the whole project? The reason I bring that up is I do know people who make a lot of monies from doing surveys. If you're charging hourly, the longer you're doing it, the more money you make. So your approach may not be unethical and I'm not suggesting it is, but in the name of, um, you know, thoroughness and getting it as accurate as it can be, um, take longer, make more money. That does, arguably influence the accuracy of the survey as well. Uh, like it or not, I said it. 
and I wouldn't have said it if I didn't live in the real world and uh, have some familiarity with, with that notion. If you're doing it yourself, what tools are you doing it with? And again, you know, I have um, many of the expensive ones, uh, NetAlly and Ekahal, anything that's a leading brand out there for the most part, I currently have or have recently have and use. Some of them I'm very adept with and do a really good job. Others, I never really understood them when I was using them. And the accuracy, even though I'm an expert, even though I'm an architect, even though I'm an engineer, it doesn't make me instantly qualified with the tools I'm using. And a lot of times I do use uh, low-end apps and I get just as much value depending on the type of survey I'm doing. Notice I said value, not accuracy. I get just as much value out of the low-end tools as I do with the high-end tools, depending on what it is that I'm doing. So at the end of all of that, and I know I've thrown a lot out there and uh, you know a lot of it might not sit well or comfortably with uh, some of you. Still at the end of it, this is my opinion and I kind of hurried through because I'm hoping that we can have some uh, decent discussion here. Um, you know, my take at the end of all of that, right? Site surveys can vary in accuracy. <clears throat> it's okay. Different surveys have different goals and different constraints, as I mentioned. You may not even be able to get into some of the places that need to be quote unquote surveyed and you have to do your best guess by going to the other side of that space or whatever. Um, you know, that's a constraint depending on the goal if you're validating design, that's one thing. If you're just sizing things up, that's a whole other thing. Um, you know, your tools, maybe the expensive tool one of your coworkers has, you've only got one of them. You still need to go do a survey, but the tool of choice is not available. So you have to default to plan B. It doesn't mean that you can't do a good survey. It's just going to have different accuracy, especially, you know, again, back to individual knowledge of how to use those tools. The big one, design validation. You obviously want as much accuracy as you can get, right? And the perfect um, approach is a good tool and a qualified person using the tool, but you've still got to keep in mind it's a commodity tool. As I mentioned before, nothing we use is calibrated, uh, typically not calibrated. We're not Verizon, we're not the carriers, we're not out doing these precision measurements because if our stuff kind of splatters out of band, um, the repercussions are huge. We believe that the, the people who made our tools got it right and that level of accuracy is good enough for the things that we do. I have a uh, Enritsu, a very expensive spectrum analyzer that was bought a few years ago for a uh, very, very specific project. It got used for that project across the span of a summertime. And by the time we were done with the project, I noticed that it was coming up on its calibration date. And if you don't get it calibrated, you can't trust the results. I mean, that is lab grade equipment. And part of the short intervals, because we let it sit for probably a year before we took it out of the box. But the bottom, you know, the the takeaway from that is there is a class of spectrum analyzer. There is a class of uh, measurement devices that actually get calibrated. And that isn't where we play in Wi-Fi land typically. And that should kind of shape how you view your own abilities to be accurate. Even like I said, if you get everything else right, this is not calibrated uh, equipment that we're using when we do these when we do these survey exercises. Um, I know some people don't like to hear this either the delta between very good and best possible when it comes to accuracy that can be a pretty expensive jump. I can go in and I can do a really really good job you know maybe in a day. I can do the best possible job in three days. Is the difference between the two levels of accuracy worth it? Eh, 
Sometimes it is, probably, depending on the uh, specific situation. But regardless, it's probably going to have a pretty short shelf life. There aren't that many environments where Wi-Fi is that when you're measuring it are not going to change significantly in a short amount of time, you know, hours, days, weeks, whatever. In my opinion, you know, the bolded bullet there is pretty important. Even the most accurate survey, I consider a useful approximation. It's almost like a heat map. It's functional eye candy. It represents the best stab at something, but it's still an approximation. It's still a point in time approximation. It is not fact. It is not scientific fact that can be uh, reproduced and revalidated over and over and over. You could probably get close at times, but that's different than precision. And as I mentioned several times, you know, surveys are point in time. So the other part of that is because it was point in time, the notion of ongoing monitoring uh, is pretty important when the Wi-Fi mission is actually critical. If what you found in the survey or what you, you know, showed in the survey is so critical that it stays at that level, uh, that the RF environment stays at that level, you're probably gonna wanna do some ongoing monitoring because the survey itself doesn't guarantee anything after the survey is done. And with that, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to digest. Yeah. And curious your opinion or your take on that, Jim, and uh, everybody else that's listening. Yeah, thanks, Lee. And I, I had two things to add. Um, one is uh, even with the, the most precise, most accurate site surveys, um, all we're measuring is is the beacon frames, measuring the RSSI from those. And with, yeah, I was actually surprised. I had a conversation with somebody that's actually involved in designing enterprise APs on the, the file layer side. And he thought the whole idea of doing site surveys based on beacons was, was kind of strange. I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> what do you mean? That's what we do. He said, yeah, but think about how data frames are transmitted. It's totally different. You're going to use all the radio chains involved. And in modern FIs, you're often going to do beam forming. And the transmit power is going to be different from the transmit power that's used for sending beacon frames. Uh, so they're very different animals. And so we can sort of fool ourselves when we, we do a site survey, a typical site survey, um, into thinking that um, we have a, a knowledge of what the, the, you know, a real client is going to receive from an AP um, based on that. Now, it's not worthless, but I think, you know, to, to back up what you're saying, Lee, it's an approximation and it, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't over value the, how uh, precise it may be. My other, my other takeaway is, is site surveys. And this is something that I think about in general with Wi-Fi. They're entirely focused on downlink performance. What's the RSSI from the AP? And is that, you know, where we want it to be? But more and more uplink performance from the clients to the APs, uh, you know, is 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 really important, uh, particularly in areas where, like large public venues, where there's going to be a lot of uplink, and it's you know the design has to be very very carefully done. Um, but also now in six gigahertz, where we can't count on, you know, I think. We, we've sort of gotten away with ignoring uplink to some degree because a lot of clients transmit at higher power than APs are often set to in, in the enterprise where we have higher, a higher density of APs. So we reduce the transmit power. And so the cells are a little bit smaller, less, less CCI, but that's yeah. getting, that's getting flipped on its head in six gigahertz in the U S where there's that six DB 
reduction in power that the client um, has to comply with versus the AP. So I think, you know, that's going to be something that we need to pay attention to. And we can't just assume that uh, what we've learned in a site survey is going to um, be good enough to understand what will happen in the uplink direction too. No, those are great points. And, you know, one of the things that I do and I try to get the people who, you know, basically end up answering to me about some of the field stuff, you know, there's the survey, the way we typically think of the survey is Wi-Fi uh, professionals, you know, all the, the RF stuff. But again, you're gathering information, right? So we throw in some performance testing, even if it's very informal. Take the internet out of it. We have a reliable speed test server somewhere that we can go to, even if we pop one in temporarily. And just, you know, you've got the RF side of it, just gather up you know, X number of performance points for, um, even if it's not your own device, somebody's out there, well, this particular iPhone in this office, this is what they got to our speed tester. It may be important later on as a baseline, something to come back and compare to. It may not, but it's something beyond, it's, to me, it's part of the quote unquote survey in certain instances. Um, you know, sometimes it makes sense to do this you know, beyond the survey, survey type stuff, just to add some reality to it. It's like, okay, we've got what the signals are saying. We've got what, or the signal values are telling us as we measure them. What does it feel like for real? And, you know, you can get lost doing that or you can just do a little bit of it, but it, it does help to like, you know, I, I'm trying to augment what you're saying about the things that we don't get out of it just based on typical surveys. What does it feel like to the real user? And I, I try to throw some of that in there too. It may not be easily reported on, but they're good data points along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I think just validating with real world devices, you know, the, the classic example is if you're designing for voice, you do your design, you put everything up, everything looks good, but you still, you know, get out that VoIP handset, start a call and walk around and make sure the call quality is good. Um, because there's, there's a lot that a survey doesn't tell you absolutely uh, about the Wi-Fi network. So a couple of good questions, um, we can get to in the Q and a first from Scott McNeil. Thanks for the question, Scott. He says, we all know RF is an ever-changing animal. How long would you say a survey is valid before it should be done again? Uh, well, that's a great question. It's a big question. I don't know if there's a single answer, so I'll try to uh, not spin wheels too much. I would say certainly if you're changing uh, vendors or changing technology, but you reusing the same design <clears throat> because you're comfortable with it, absolutely you're gonna wanna do a, a validation survey. But that aside, um, I, it goes back to my uh, question of, well, what is it that you're surveying for? Um, you know, if you've got a, a perceived trouble-free environment, you know, you get zero trouble tickets and, you know, from lots and lots of users who are likely to complain if there is an issue or whatever. If you're using monitoring tools and they don't show any uh, real reasons for concern, you know, all of that makes me wonder why you would ever survey, um, you know, what's behind it, what's driving the perceived need to do a survey. Um, if your client devices radically change, again, the notion of, well, how are you surveying? There may not be any reason to take out your surveying tool, but you're certainly wanna, gonna wanna test the new clients in the same environment. Different kind of survey than maybe, you know, the, you know, going out and doing the signals classification, but at the same time, it's important. So I can't give a good, straight, clear answer, but I can kind of give you some of the thoughts that go into why I can't give a good, straight, clear answer. I don't know if you can do better than me on that one, Jim. Yeah, I'm curious what Scott's take is on that because I, I think he does a lot of site surveying in industrial um, areas that uh, probably need 
surveys more often than other places. I, I think it, of course, it depends is, is the, the easy answer, but it really depends on how often there are physical changes in the environment. Um, you know, if it's carpeted office space, that's pretty stable, then a survey once a year might be fine. Maybe you could stretch it out further. If it's, you know, a hospital that's, and that's, you know, undergoing construction and equipment's being moved around and it's a really mission critical environment, you need them more frequently. Um, I think, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. You, you reminded me that what Scott does for a living with the industrial stuff and yeah, I can see if you've got a big, uh, you know, factory floor that gets reconfigured and Wi-Fi is being used on the, on the line, uh, as they say. I, I can imagine that kind of environment. You're really going to be surveying more to make sure that the new configuration stands up in the, you know, in the existing wireless environment or whatever, uh, where the client devices are changing. But um, yeah, yeah, you know, which is probably obviously going to be a port operations too, obviously going to be far more dynamic than, you know, probably most offices are. So scenario dependent, I guess is one answer. Mm -hmm. And Daniel mentions in the, in the chat, it also depends not only on when clients change or the environment changes, but when the requirements for the network change and that's, you know, driven by new applications being used in the network and, I know Lee and in, in higher education where you are, I'm sure the apps that, that show up on the network are changing uh, very quickly. Yeah, they are. And it's interesting. Um, more and more, the assumption is mobile devices and um, arguably less bandwidth. I mean, you could do a lot with the big robust laptops and all of that, but most of the, where we see radical increases in device device, counts is in the mobile space where the applications are actually a lot more forgiving and a lot less bandwidth because they're made to work on, you know, low bandwidth mobile networks sometimes. And it, it's very interesting, but then, you know, you might have, you know, a whole bunch of mobile devices thrown in with a couple of big top end power Macs and you got to satisfy all of them. So it, it is interesting. And they're all using the same apps, just, you know, designed differently for the device in question. Yeah, for sure. A uh, quick one from Nick, uh, and I'll take this one. He says, can, can continuous monitoring with a tool like 7Signal take the place of validation surveys, given that there's data coming from clients and from SAFRI? And that's a good question. And I think, um, I think it sort of changes the relationship. If you've got the continuous monitoring from your clients, so that you know when there are performance issues or coverage issues or roaming issues or interference issues, you can use those to trigger a site survey as part of that remediation. So you can identify proactively the locations that are having issues um, and see if those are, you know, new issues and then use that, uh, you know, uh, uh, find out and, and start the process of doing a, a validation survey or a troubleshooting survey uh, based on that. So it can help answer the question that we just had, how often do you need to do it? If you have monitoring in place, that can tell you when it's when it, when you need to do it. Um, and then maybe last question from Rick. He says, are Wi-Fi surveys going to be more or less important when you deploy a Wi-Fi 6E network? And uh, that's a good one. What are your thoughts there, Lee? Well, I don't know. I'm assuming when you say, de you know, deploying a 6E network, you're also talking 6E slash 5 slash 2.4. So as opposed to a strictly 6E environment, I, you know, I'm assuming that you're never going to not do uh, all three bands, but maybe I'm wrong. But anyhow, it is... A fascinating question because there's just so many <laughs> so many channels. I mean, I can almost picture, you know, putting APs out. And if you're strictly talking 6E, 
when you've got a sense of what their power is and your environment is wide open enough that, you know, they're basically zero, you know, or very low attenuation between them um, from walls and whatever. I can picture scenarios where you can just go crazy and put one here, put one here, put one here and do just fine. Um, you know, as long as your perception of how the power is going to be and the coverage is going to be, it's like, I can imagine with that much to choose from, you could make the case to say, just over engineer, put in 10% more APs than you need and you'll do fine and negate the need for, uh, you know, a real survey and you're always going to do okay. But that also um, feels really cheesy just to even say, but I can picture it happening. Um, you know, it goes back to the, my phrase there, scenario dependent. I guess it really depends on what you're doing. I can't see the need for surveys to ever go away, but I can certainly see um, less need for them if you can leverage your experience um, to just, you know, do things in the absence of a survey. Give yourself the constraint. I'm not going to do a survey. I can't do a survey. Well, how else could you keep that environment healthy and can you do it enough with what you know? Um, I, I can picture scenarios where sure, it would be pretty easy. And I can picture other ones where, oh, Jesus, never, no, I can't do that. <laughs> I got a survey, you know? So it's kind of a really uh, wankerish answer to what was probably a simple question, but there's a lot of food for thought with that question. Yeah, there is a lot of food for thought there. And I, I'd like to see new capabilities built into survey uh, tools specifically for six gigahertz. You know, I mentioned the, the challenges with uplink performance, and I'd really like to see some kind of modeling or estimation from um, the survey tools as to what the uplink of uh, uh, performance will be like for clients. We know the signal strength is a little bit below um, five gigahertz, not, not a lot, but we also know that some clients don't have antennas that are are designed well for six gigahertz, and they they have numbers RSSIs that are very different from five gigahertz. But uh, you know, again, that that United States uh, low power indoors client six dB reduction in transmit power versus the AP is something that really needs some attention. Um, so. I, I think site surveys are important or just as important now that we're adding a third band for coverage. Um, but we need some, uh, some new capabilities there to really understand it better. You know, one thing I didn't uh, uh, touch on at all, but you know, you talk about your wish list of what you'd like to see. I would love to see somehow and I don't know how you do this, but I'd like to see somehow installed infrastructures that are capable of surveying themselves with AI, not just monitoring, but actual, give me the equivalent. And I know there's a lot to this, but give me the equivalent of somebody walking around, produce those results. Yeah. And you could say that, well, you know, the APs are all mounted on the ceiling, so they're just going to see each other at that height. My answer to that is, well, again, AI solves everything. What if you've got APs on the floor below? Let the second floor APs talk to the third floor APs, understand the difference in attenuation of that floor, and somehow, you know, use this uh, AI revolution to kind of negate the need to do a resurvey. But I, it's easy yeah. to talk about. It's easy to ask for. It's another thing to, it's another thing to, you know, deliver on that. So. Well, and all, all the way back in 2008, we got the 802.11 K amendment. seems like agent history, but that, that actually created a, a function for um, clients to be able to send their um, RSSI reports, their beacon reports up to the AP. So if that was widely supported and, you know, vendors were making use of it, you, you could build something like a, a real-time site survey from that client data. We have client location now with, with FTM, but again, all these things were poorly or mostly unimplemented. So 
can't do that yet. Scott says Roomba surveys. Okay, I, th I think that means we've jumped the shark. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, Heather, we can transition now. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Lee, as always. Let me get Eric set up here. You should be emerging from the shadows very shortly. Ooh, pretty rainbow. <laughs> Look at that yeah. little test pattern. Yeah, you like that? that ABC a... is off the air. Let's try this again. <laughs> there we go. Hey, there we go. How is everybody out there? All right. Well, hey, guys. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Heather. It's time. It is time for 7 Minutes with 7 Signal, where we take a little feature inside 7 Signal, unpack it, and show you how it can have awesome value. I'm going to share my screen. Gosh, you know, we've been talking about site surveys today and how a site survey is just a point in time, right? Yep, a lunch break there. It's, the, it's a point in time. And you guys know this, Wi-Fi is a living, breathing device, or it's a living, breathing entity, okay? And how do you know when you need to trigger that site survey, like Jim was saying a moment ago? Where are the changes? How are the changes taking place? Is a device being all that it can be based upon my design? Well, that's what we use Mobileye for. Mobileye is software we're going to put on your device and we're going to be able to see how is your device doing in the design? Is your device being that all that it can be? Or is your device underperforming? Good design does not necessarily mean good Wi-Fi experience because of a confluence of factors. So if we can see the performance of a device from its point of view and how it interacts with the design, we can learn a lot about what we need to do next. Okay, so for example, we're in Mobileye here and we're looking at Lens MacBook Pro. And you know, Lens MacBook Pro is, uh, it's all over the place with regards to the overall Wi-Fi quality that we call 7MCS. 7MCS is just normalized for Mac and Windows. Uh, regardless of Phi, we just come up with a zero to 11 score, basically, that takes into account, again, the Phi, the channel width, the spatial streams of the client, uh, and, and the data rate in order to determine, can, is this client being all that it can be? This is where we learn where the, the Wi-Fi experience rubber meets the road. Okay, so check this out, guys. This is really interesting. So depending upon what I, depending upon where the client actually is, we're gonna see changes to seven MCS or the MCS score. This is really, really interesting. So look at this. We would expect his MacBook Pro, if you look over here, which is a three by three device and seven signal keeps track of all of these things for you because we use it in order to determine if the device is being all that it can be. Okay, so three by three, I would expect this to be at like a 1300 megabit per second data rate with really good conditions. And here you can see that right over here on the right of your screen, 1300 megabits per second data rate, MCS of nine, as you can see at the top, awesome signal to noise ratio. Look at that, it's amazing. Okay, but what about those instances where the MCS dropped dramatically? Look at this. Did this person know that they were on a 2.4 network that now the Phi changed to 802.11n? And look at their data rate, all the way dropped down to 86 megabits per second. And where is this person located? What network are they on? What access point are they connected to? All of that information is now captured, okay? Captured as opposed to a survey, which is just a point in time. Now I have a complete history of how a device is interacting and, and, and inter uh, and co-mingling with the Wi-Fi network. I wanna show you one more thing that I think you'll really like. So I'm gonna go back a couple days in time. So this is great. Remember we said that we're capturing this moment by moment, step by step. I'm gonna go back two days in time and I wanna show you a roaming instance that took place, okay? There we go, Whoop, hold on, my computer's a little slow. Hang with me, hang with me. There we go. Okay, you see all this roaming stuff over here? Where'd that go? Over a little bit to the, to the left, we should see, there we go. Okay, so over here, we see all of these roaming problems. So let's click into the timeline and take a closer look at that. So here we go, guys. What we've done is we've actually detected, if you look really closely, that this device is attached to the network at a minus 74 signal strength. 
but there's a better access point right overhead at minus 52, okay? Your design is fine. So when somebody calls you and says, hey, there's something wrong with the Wi-Fi network, it's like, well, wait a minute here. Look over your head. You see that little blue dot in the ceiling? Okay. The Wi-Fi network is fine. The design is good. Here's the problem. You're not connected to it. All right. Your device decided to stick and not roam. Oh, by the way, what kind of device do you have? Let me look over here. Oh, you've got a MacBook. And I know based upon experience that MacBooks don't like to roam until they get to like minus 74 or minus 75. So then how do you design a network to support both Windows that like to roam at minus 70 and MacBooks that like to roam at minus 75? I don't have the answer to that. But that's what I wanted to share with you today. And I hope you enjoyed. And I just want to remind everybody out there that while you and me, we can't see or hear Wi-Fi, 7Signal can. Thanks for joining us, everybody.